This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight, a special Unsolved Mysteries report, Mysteries of the Afterlife. It is perhaps a fundamental question of the ages, the ultimate mystery, what happens when we die? Physical death does not exist. The body dies, but there's a new body waiting for you. And you simply step into that, and there you are. I know what it's like to die. I know what it's like to see the other side, and I know what it's like to come back. In recent years, thousands of credible people have come forward with remarkable accounts of a transcendent journey to the brink of death. They have returned, transformed by what they believe was a glimpse into a life after this life. The explosion of interest in such near-death experiences has generated a lively and controversial debate. Many people are now convinced traditional views of heaven and hell may soon give way to a new concept of what lies beyond the grave. In the next hour, three dramatic stories about life, death, and the hereafter. In 1975, Daniel Brinkley was struck down by a powerful bolt of lightning. His miraculous near-death experience very literally changed his life. When Karen Walker died of cancer at 21, her grief-stricken parents embarked on a spiritual journey that they say enabled them to communicate with Karen's spirit. To all appearances, Heidi Weirich seems like any other eight-year-old. But Heidi has consistently described strange visions of people no one else can see. Real people who passed away long before Heidi was even born. Is it simply her imagination? Or does Heidi have a special gift that enables her to move among the dead? Join us for this special report as we explore the mysteries of the afterlife. about to meet a psychic named Daniel Brinkley. He is perhaps best known for his book, Saved by the Light, a dramatic account of his brush with the afterlife. Daniel's is a remarkable story, made more remarkable by the manner in which he apparently acquired his psychic powers. It was on a blustery night some 20 years ago, September 17, 1975. Severe thunderstorms were sweeping through the southeast. Daniel, then 25, was at home in Aiken, South Carolina with his wife, Sandy. I'm gonna check on dinner. All right. Hey, Tommy. Daniel was on the phone with his best friend, Tom, when the storm passed directly overhead. At least 180,000 volts of electricity shot through Daniel's body, a jolt so powerful it left his shoes welded to the floor. Oh, my God! Daniel! I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't talk. I didn't know what had happened. I was on fire and burning. And then all of a sudden, I'm out of my body. I saw Sandy checking me to see if I was breathing and start to work on me and push it on my chest and clearing my airway. Tommy heard the explosion and he was on his way over. He got there, he was a corpsman in the Navy. He wrapped me, he went to work on me. He's trying to get my heart started. He's pushing, he's breathing in my mouth. He's talking to me. I look over his shoulder and in my mind, the first thing I thought is I always thought I was a much better looking guy than that. But I never got a chance to think any more about it. For all intents and purposes, Daniel Brinkley was clinically dead. 
He claims that he then embarked on what has come to be recognized as a classic near-death experience. I start down this tunnel. I see what appears to be a form coming out of this beautiful, misty blue. Then all of a sudden, I saw a panoramic life review. I not only felt everything I'd ever done and saw everything I'd ever done, I became every person that I had ever encountered. In his youth, Daniel was, by his own admission, self-centered and mean, nothing short of a bully. The pattern continued during a tour of duty in Southeast Asia. Daniel says he was now forced to confront those he had victimized through the years. I felt the pain and the anguish and the anger and the frustration that I had caused these people. And you know, people don't realize that you judge yourself when this happens. You just judge yourself. And that's what I did. Daniel was rushed to the hospital. In the emergency room, his breathing faltered, then stopped. Minutes later, Daniel's best friend, Tom Hall, was told that he was dead. I just had a hard time dealing with this. So they had wheeled Danny into this, uh, a little dark room. I have no idea what made me go back in there. I just had to see for myself. And I just felt like, you know, I, that he wasn't gone. And I saw the sheet moving. I all of a sudden went from a spiritual place and world back into this place where I'm in a hospital. I'm under this sheet and I'm looking up at it. I can't move, I can't talk, I'm on fire again. Doctor, nurse, doc, doc, doctor, nurse, he, he, he's breathing. Miraculously, Daniel Brinkley returned to life nearly 28 minutes after he says he had been declared dead. Dr. Williams said he's in pretty bad shape. The way it looks, that the lightning went down his back and I think it just shattered his nerve system. The doctors never did say he'll die or he'll live. He never did, he just said, well, taking one minute at a time or one hour at a time or one day at a time. After a week in the hospital, Daniel was released. He was hardly able to walk or talk. His eyes were so light sensitive that he had to wear dark welder's glasses at all times. I was partially paralyzed for seven months and it took two years to learn to walk and feed myself. And I had a lot of time to lie on my back hurting so bad falling down and blacking out and breaking my nose and not knowing where I was, but the visions and the things that had happened in this, now what we call the near-death experience, have stayed with me longer and more coherently than virtually anything that ever happened. Daniel remembered being led into what looked like a magnificent glowing cathedral, which he recognized as a place of learning. Before him were 13 figures, which he calls beings. Daniel says the beings approached him one at a time, each thrusting a box towards him. Inside of each box were tiny images of an event yet to happen. Daniel claims that altogether he witnessed 117 future occurrences, including the election of Ronald Reagan, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the Gulf War in 1991. Daniel later shared his visions with several of his friends who are now willing to verify that Daniel did indeed predict events before they happened. Daniel first made it start making his predictions as, uh, as he was convalescing. He was talking about Wormwood, which became Chernobyl. And he was talking about the food lines in Russia, about their starving. And uh, there was just a lot of predictions that, you know, that I, I didn't pay that much attention to him at the time. He'd always talked about the Gulf War and the collapse of communism and things like that. But at the time, you didn't think that much about it. But then when it came about is when you really start thinking about it. What's the matter with you today? I just got a lot on my mind, Tommy. Yeah. Daniel now believes that his near-death experience marked the birth of his psychic abilities. Why don't you just tell me about it? 
But in the months just after the accident, he admits he was simply a dazed and bewildered young man who had undergone a dramatic transformation. Talk about crazy, you being dead and all. That's just it, Tommy. I wasn't dead. I was really confused. You know, I'd never heard of the near-death experience. And I literally was driving people nuts because I wanted somebody to tell me either it didn't happen, which I knew it did, and or, or please explain it. I've been astounded at the number of people I've met who have had such an experience. Almost a year after the accident, in the spring of 1976, Danyan attended a lecture given by Dr. Raymond Moody, one of the country's earliest authorities on near-death experiences. Our very notions of death. That day changed my life forever, because that's when I knew I wasn't completely crazy. Perhaps someone here has had a similar experience. Dr. Moody, I, I've had one of them experiences. He gave me a way for someone who was kind and understanding to explain to me what might have happened to me. When I heard his account, um, it seemed very consistent with what I had heard from many other people. I, I saw this light and I started going towards it. And, and it's something that happens to quite a number of patients who get resuscitated following cardiac arrest and therefore for that reason, doctors need to know about this so that they can reassure the patient that they're not alone, that in fact that this occurs fairly frequently. These beings were like full of light and Dr. Moody is also able to verify at least one of Danyan's predictions. And, and things about the future, things that were going to happen to our country. And In our April world. of 1976, he told me that in 1990, there was going to be a breakdown of the Soviet Union and that there would be food disturbances and riots in connection with it. In the 19 years since his near-death experience, Daniel has honed his psychic abilities. Recently, those abilities were put to the test when Daniel was asked to consult on a brutal murder case. On August 12, 1993, John and Nancy Bosco of Big Fork, Montana, had been shot to death, execution style, as they slept. The police investigation turned up absolutely no leads. Two months later, John's mother, Tony, met with Daniel Brinkley. He immediately began to describe a suspect. This is a kid. This is a slight bill kid with black hair. This is someone who knows John. He knew the layout of this house. He's away at college. In the very early part of December, this little kid will be caught, and he's in a college somewhere out west. I have to say that I just shook my head, and I thought to myself, uh, I made a mistake in coming down. Daniel doesn't, you know, this, this isn't going to get me anywhere. I couldn't begin to make sense out of what he was saying. But amazingly, Daniel Brinkley was correct on all counts. Just as he predicted, a suspect, 18-year-old Shadow Clark, was arrested in December and later convicted. Incredibly, Clark had lived in the murder house, did know the Boscos, and he was attending college in the West. Daniel had apparently solved the case through the power of his mind. This is new to me, and sometimes it's troublesome because I pick up things that I don't want to know about, and if someone's intense around me, I'm perceiving it, but, and I try to, I'm still trying to figure out ways to turn it off. Okay, and at the same time, ways to perfect it. And during the experiments, I want you to only respond with... In an attempt to verify Daniel's purported powers, noted parapsychologist Dr. William Roll observed Daniel in a series of tests. Hello. Okay, Daniel. <clears throat> you mind if I just see your hand? Okay. Daniel gave readings for eight people he had never met things. before. In several instances, he picked out details about the lives of these uh, individuals. There were uh, uh, facts that uh, he could not have known. It was like you knew when to pull out, and that's recognized by your family. They From the uh, brief experiments we did this time, I, I would say he's uh, uh, one of the uh, 
uh, more remarkable psychics uh, that I have worked with, for sure, uh, and perhaps in the country. Hey, lady, how you doing? Looking pretty today. Hi, young lady. Today, Daniel Brinkley devotes much of his time to volunteering at hospices and nursing homes throughout the country. Jim, how things going? Daniel believes that his own profound experience has left Hello. him uniquely qualified to counsel others. Hi, Helen. How are you doing? Hi. Good to see you again. They say you never can know what it's like until you've been there. I know what it's like to be afraid. I know what it's like to face death. I know what happens when the doctors and the religious world loses its credibility to you at certain stages. Hi, Carrie. What day, man? Good morning. How do you feel? Doing fine. You have the flowers looking really great this morning. Thank you so much. Perhaps the most remarkable aspect of Daniel's story is his transformation from the self-centered bully of his youth to the good Samaritan of today. I have found a way to receive love from people in hospices and nursing homes. And I don't know if that's balance in the books, but I don't care whether that is or not, for I've dealt with it. And I've dealt with all that I've been and all that's happened to me. And I dealt with it, and then I went to work. If Daniel Brinkley's was an isolated case, it might be easy to explain away or perhaps even dismiss but incredibly, some researchers estimate that more than 8 million Americans have had a near-death experience. While few claim to become psychics, many of them describe a journey fantastically similar to Daniel Brinkley's. As I went unconscious, all I saw was darkness. That darkness gradually took the shape of a tunnel. And way off, absolutely positively to infinity, appeared this little speck of white light. This was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever experienced in my life. It was just extraordinary. I then experienced a complete total life review. I was then given a choice to return to normal life or stay and become part of this light. Prior to this experience, what I had figured out was that when you die, you die, the show is over, everything goes black and that's it. I had thought about such things as religion and so on, and I thought that it was just a bunch of foolishness. I didn't really know where I was. It's just I looked up and I saw this bright light at the end of a tunnel, and there were colored bricks on the walls of the tunnel. And then I saw this lady. She took my hand. She said, I'm Elizabeth, and I will help you. She just led me into the light and through the light and into heaven. I just felt that this was the place I wanted to be. It, I was still alive. There was still a part of me, like my soul, my spirit was still alive. I wasn't dead at all. The near-death experience is not a recent phenomenon. Reports of people coming back from the dead date to the Middle Ages. However, over the last two decades, advances in modern medicine have made dramatic resuscitation much more frequent. There's no question in my mind that near-death experiences are real to the people to whom they happen. That is, that, that it's interpreted as a real event. It makes enormous change in their life and so on. And so it's in that sense, it's a part of their reality. But for the rest of us who haven't had that kind of experience, we just can't know. We can't know based on what someone else says or, or reports. Is the near-death experience truly a peek into the afterlife or is it the physical manifestation of the human body breaking down as it dies? Dr. Susan Blackmore, a psychologist, believes all the major components of the near-death experience can be explained. There are two main things that we need to understand that are happening in the brain, either when it comes close to death or is under severe stress. One of these is a lack of oxygen. The tunnel is a good example of something I think we can explain in terms of what's happening in the brain. 
in the visual cortex where all visual information is processed, we know that the way the cells are laid out is so that there are lots and lots of cells towards the middle of what you're looking at, fading out towards lots of the outside. Now, when you come close to death or are under severe stress, what happens is that all these cells start randomly firing. Well, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like a bright light in the middle fading off towards dark at the outside. Then you'll find that a lack of oxygen will produce visions, hallucinations, flashbacks to one's past life, and even feelings of floating, flying, and out-of-body experiences. Endorphins also can do that. They act to make you feel relaxed, floating, pleasant. It's a very, very nice feeling. Terrible things might be happening, your body might be down there, blood all over the place, you know, but it feels okay. And I think it can, at its best, lead to a kind of mystical acceptance, which can be quite profound. I would have to say that some of the things they're saying is true, that that may be happening to some. It may be hallucinations to others. But then there are those of us that move the step past that, and we have a soul. We're powerful spiritual beings. I'm starting where their definitions and explanations leave off. Many people argue that if you can understand all these experiences in terms of brain chemicals, that somehow makes them unimportant, but not so at all. The fact that you can see your life in a different context, feel different about yourself and about other people, see what's important and what isn't important, that's what changes lives. I don't mind if that's created by brain chemicals or going to heaven. The important fact is that it make, can make you a better person. The explanations that I have heard proposed of, of near-death experiences are interesting. And of course, uh, you know, we should encourage uh, physiological studies of everything, all kinds of, uh, of mental states and so on. But uh, my assessment is that we just don't know the answer to this yet. And that uh, I don't feel myself in any great hurry to come to the answer yet. I mean, it's a mystery. If we are to believe, even for an instant, that the living can go to the brink of death and return, then we must consider another incredible possibility. Can the dead themselves come back from the other side, perhaps to take care of unfinished business? The death of a family member is perhaps one of the most difficult experiences any of us will ever endure. Who among us has not longed for just one final opportunity to speak with a departed loved one? Incredibly, a woman in Southern California believes she got that chance after the death of her daughter. Karen Walker was the only child of Jean and Tom Walker. Born in 1949, Karen had what would be considered a perfectly ordinary upbringing. Karen was a very imaginative child. A very affectionate person, very bright, read extensively uh, from the time she was about three. I no longer had to read to her, she would read the stories to me instead, which was wonderful. One story in particular would come to symbolize the closeness Karen and her parents felt for each other, the three musketeers. The familiar phrase, all for one, one for all, became the Walker family motto. When Karen was 17, the family circle expanded to include her new boyfriend, Jim Alvarado. Karen and Jim seemed an unlikely match. Jim came from a large working class family. He was a poor student who had been told he'd never amount to much. Karen knew better. She saw something in me in terms of, of potential as far as my intellect was concerned, you're right. And even though she, at that time she didn't know, you know, what I lacked necessarily in academic skills, although over that period of time in study hall she began to, to learn, and she began to help me even then. The clause may be renaming the subject. But still there were times when Jim's mind would wander. Karen had her own special way of getting him back on track. The clause may be renaming the subject. Remember to pay attention. Oh, You're for? not going to get into college this way. And she would get my attention, and, and I would straighten up and, and, and get back to work and, and do what I had to do. She was my tutor, she was my helper, she was my friend, and somebody who I loved very, very much. In December of 1969, when Karen was 20, tragedy struck. The cause of a lingering pain in her right leg was finally diagnosed. Karen had Ewing's sarcoma, 
a rare, usually fatal form of cancer. That's good. We reacted with horror, but with determination. We were going to see to it that she got well. The three musketeers were going to stay together. How are you feeling? Uh, better. Karen began an exhaustive regimen of radiation and chemotherapy treatments. Then on February 20th, 1970, Karen suffered an agonizing setback. Oh. Ah. Karen woke up about 5 o'clock in the morning. Mom! Pain in her leg for the first time in a long time. She had been going through cobalt therapy, and the pain had disappeared. And suddenly, the pain was excruciating. It's my leg. It hurts. It hurts. Oh. OK. Can't move it. The cancer had eaten the bone completely through. The bone was no longer there. Through it all, Karen's spirit was indomitable. Jim proposed in March, and a wedding date was set, December 19, 1970. But on December 7th, Karen lapsed into a coma. Though devastated, Tom and Jean accepted the inevitable. From the time Karen was in the hospital, Tom would bring her every day a single red rose. And that was just kind of a symbol between them. They, you know, that was their little affectionate thing that they did. She looks so beautiful. I want you to know that if you have to leave us, me and your mom, we understand. But remember, what, whatever happens, what, we'll always be together. Remember what we used to say about the Three Musketeers, how we'd always stick together, huh? One for all and all for one. When I learned that the tumor had gone into the brain, I knew we had reached the end. She woke up in the middle of the night, and I held her hand and asked her, how she was, because that was the first time she had talked to me in nine days. How are you feeling, honey? Mom, it's time. I can't go on like this anymore. I can't think anymore. I understand. Is it OK? Of course. Please tell Dad and tell Jim that it was my decision that I was ready to go. I will, I promise. You rest now. I love you, Mom. I love you, too. And as I was watching, something went out of the top of her head. It just lifted. And it was like a wisp of smoke or, or fog or something. And as I saw that happen, I said, goodbye, Karen. Karen died on December 17th, two days before she would have been married. I was devastated. I was, you know, not really feeling any, any physical pain, but emotionally, I was feeling terrible. And, uh, I guess at that time, I was searching for the answers why and, and, you know, angered. The night after Karen passed away, Jim stayed at Gene and Tom's home. He sat up late in the hope that studying would take his mind off the loss. Incredibly, Jim was about to get the first hint that Karen's spirit had survived. It, it was more than a kick. It was really an awakening on my part that got my attention. And I realized that at that point that, you know, Karen was, was with me at that point. Jim's brief encounter helped him cope with Karen's death, but it was only an inkling of what was to come. When we return, Jean and Tom Walker journey into a world of mediums and psychics, and Karen's spirit breaks through. On December 17, 1970, 21-year-old Karen Walker passed away after a long bout with cancer. Seeking consolation, her parents, Tom and Jean, went to visit family near San Francisco. 
There, over the next few days, they sought out psychics and mediums in the faint hope that they might contact Karen's spirit. Three times they tried, and three times the walkers went away disappointed. The message is from Abraham. They left for home on Christmas Day. Passing through Santa Barbara, they decided to call a medium Gene had once read about. His name was the Reverend George Daisley. Reverend Daisley answered the phone and told Tom that he was very sorry, but he was booked six months ahead. And so Tom said, well, could we make an appointment for six months from now? And Reverend Daisy said, just a minute, just a minute. The spirits are telling me I must see you immediately. Could you stay overnight? And Tom, of course, said, well, yes, of course. And so we made the appointment for the next morning and went to see him. Gene and Tom agreed to limit the information they gave Reverend Daisley. While they did tell him their daughter had recently died, they did not give him Karen's name. 19 hours had passed since the phone conversation. The walkers were confident Reverend Daisley could not have learned anything about them overnight. I knew they were grieving parents. Simply because Today, George Daisley is 83 years old. He still lives in Santa Barbara. It is known that I knew nothing about them whatsoever otherwise. Nothing whatsoever. Many years ago, this is where we do our sittings. Uh -huh. The sitting commenced just after 10 a.m. Some people like to take notes during our sitting. Daisley's if first I impressions hear were astounding. Your voice, I will tell you everything that she says. Your daughter is here. She is safe. She is well. She says she doesn't hurt anymore. She wants me to tell you that you were the three musketeers and you still are. She says, we are the three musketeers and we'll always be together. I was just flabbergasted that she could come up with the one piece of information that was so specific to us. I think if she had said nothing else that day, I would always, always know that Karen was still alive. I'm hearing the name Karen. Yes, yes, it's Karen. It's her birthday soon. I believe, yes, January the 12th. She wants you to celebrate her birthday. The details literally spilled out of Reverend Daisley. The Three worry. Musketeers, Karen's name, musketeers. her birthday, even detailed descriptions of two photographs taken when Karen was a child. We went home smiling and crying, and the emotions were just volatile. Uh, but there was always, from then on, there was that underlying current of, I know she's OK. According to Jean, Karen eventually began to communicate without the aid of a medium. Incredibly, Jean says that Karen's spirit even guided her to write this book. Always Karen, published in 1975, chronicles Karen Walker's struggle with cancer, her death, and her first-hand views of a life beyond this one. When we die, we go into another dimension that from this side we can't see, but is still life. The body dies, but there's a new body waiting for you. And you simply step into that, and there you are. She said, I glow. I'm filled with light. Is it possible to bridge the chasm between the living and the dead, between our earthly life and an afterlife? In the small town of Ellerslie, Georgia, we found a little girl named Heidi Weirich, who apparently evinces that astounding ability, the ability to make contact with real people who passed over to the other side decades ago. Hello, honey. Hi. What's your name? Heidi. That's a pretty name. Heidi, you know, I live right next door. And in my backyard, I have a swing. I bet you like to swing, don't you? Yes. It all began in February of 1989, just after Heidi's family had moved to Ellerslie. 
According to Heidi, a man named Khan appeared at the front door. Would you like that? He had white hair and he had a t-shirt on with blood all over it. And he had a bandage on his hand with blood on it. Why don't you go ask your mama if it's okay? Mama? What, Heidi? Can I go play outside with the man? Is it Uncle Mark? No. What man is it? He has gray hair and he has blood on his shirt. Come here. Are you sure? Yeah. I thought someone was trying to kidnap her. I don't think he was. So I brought Heidi in and I locked all the doors and I got the butcher knife out of the kit, you know, out of the drawer and I I called my husband home. I said, Andy, you have got to come home. You know, there's somebody trying to kidnap Heidi. We got out and we walked all up and down the street, you know, trying to find somebody that fit that description, but we never, you know, found nobody. Soon after Heidi had seen Con, she started seeing a man she would call Mr. Gordy. And um, he was, he would come in the yard and she would, she would play with him outside. Hi there, Heidi. Hi. That is your name, isn't it? Yes. I'm Mr. Gordy, and I used to live in this neighborhood. In fact, I knew those people next door real well. They used to have a great swing over there in the backyard. Would you like to go over and swing with me for a few minutes? Okay. I thought that Con and Gordy was the same person, so I thought his name was Con Gordy. And that's when I started asking everybody, Did they have they ever heard of a name Con Gordy? I didn't know really who it was or, you know, if it was a real person. But then after, you know, we couldn't find nobody or nobody to fit the description, then that's when I started thinking, you know, that it was just imaginary friends that didn't really bother me too bad then. It began to bother Andy Wyrie and Lisa as well when Lisa's sister, who had bought the house next door, showed them the former owner's papers. Just read that right there. What? Right here, look. James S. Gordy. When I see Mr. Gordy's name on the deed, I mean, I was terrified. I really was, because I knew that the, the previous owners had was there, you know, years and years and years back. So I knew that Mr. Gordy, I, I knew he had to have been dead. I knew Mr. Gordy when I was a small child. And uh, Mr. Gordy owned a real estate company in Columbus. And for many, many years, he was a uh, Sunday school superintendent at our church up here, Ellison Methodist Church. And he Catherine Ledford's family had owned the house next to the Wyricks. Catherine verified that James Gordy, who was the executor of her mother's will, had died in 1974. Mr. Gordy was a well, he was a tall, lean man in stature, and he was um, had a lot of dry wit about him, but he was, he was a good man, and uh, he loved people, he loved children, and uh, he was always willing to help people and, and do things for them. I asked Heidi, did she, you know, um, at the time I asked her, did she think that it was a ghost? And she was so little at the time, she said that she didn't know because I said, does he look like a normal person or can you see through him? She said, Mr. Gordy looks just like you, Mama, just like somebody real. Let's see, we've got some pictures here. Do you think one of these might Catherine Ledford had no photographs of Mr. Gordy himself, but she corroborated Heidi's description. Mr. Gordy had gray hair, always wore a suit and tie, and shiny black shoes. Catherine did bring over photographs of her family, many of whom had once lived right next door. I was looking through the pictures and I never saw one of them people. And when I got to the bottom, there's this little bitty picture. That's the guy with the bandage on his arm and the, and the blood on his shirt. That's Con. Well, you know who that is, baby? His name is Lon, and he's my uncle. It was Lon that you saw. Lon lived here when he was a young man. He died in 1957 of cancer. And he lost his hand at a very early age, I would say before he was 20 years old, in a cotton gin up here in Ellerslie. Um, when I saw him, he was um, 
he was holding his right hand under his left hand, and he was doing that in the picture. When I found out that that uh, it was Miss Kelly's uncle, and his name really wasn't Con, it was Lon. It scared me to death because I knew Heidi was really seeing something. And she was so small at the time, and she couldn't really speak that well. So I, I knew right then she was mistaken, and it wasn't Con, it was Lon. Had little Heidi Weirig somehow tapped into the afterlife? Her visions of Lon and Mr. Gordy remained consistent and benign for three years. Then Heidi's mother, Lisa, became pregnant. When we return, a new, unknown entity manifests itself in an ominous and threatening fashion. For more than four years, young Heidi Weirich of Ellerslie, Georgia, continued to encounter the benevolent spirits of two men, James Gordy and Lon Batchelor, both long dead. But soon after Heidi's mother became pregnant in 1993, a sinister pall fell over Heidi's house of spirits. She had never been scared of anything. She had never been scared of, of Con. She had never been scared of Mr. Gordy. But when she seen the dark figure in our hallway, she was hysterical. She was, I mean, frightened. She was screaming. She was terrified. The new spirit became a frequent but unwelcome guest, sometimes visible and sometimes only sensed. At first, we, had, me and my husband had talked about moving. And, uh, but then, like I told him, I said, I don't think it would do any good to move because wherever we go, she's, she's just got that gift that she's gonna, she's gonna see people from the past or people that has been dead. On February 3rd, 1994, Heidi's baby sister Jordan was born. Two weeks later, Heidi's otherworldly visitations took a horrifying turn. She had just deep gashes down her face, and it terrified me. I didn't know what it was. I mean, it was so bad that the blood had come to the surface. I mean, and I, I didn't know what it was, and I figured, well, it's so bad, it's gonna leave a scar. And I couldn't imagine what could have scratched her that bad. I thought maybe she had scratched herself during the night, and I didn't really think too much about it. So about Two nights later, I woke up. My side was just burning like fire. <sighs> Lisa, Lisa, what is it? I had three claw marks going around my side. So the next night I went to sleep and I woke up and I had three claw marks down my back. And then it happened again the next night and I woke up and I had three claw marks down my chest. Maybe it might be a rat in the house, but I know that, you know, I would have woke up if I'd have felt a rat crawling on me and scratching my face or side or whatever. But after it happened four nights straight, and, and it got to a point where me and Lisa would go to bed, and then I'd tell her, I said, if I wake up in the morning and I got scratches on me, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I was worried to death that it was gonna scratch the baby. And uh, that's when, you know, I was so worried. I thought, well, I've got to do something before it scratches her. And that's when I called Dr. Roll. Once again, parapsychologist Dr. William Roll was a logical choice to investigate and perhaps explain the unusual occurrences. You were standing here. And, and, and where was Mr. Gordy standing, do you think? On September 12th of this year, Dr. Roll visited the Weirich's house. Okay. She came up with physical descriptions and, and with names that she apparently could not have obtained in any ordinary way. So that immediately made me interested in the case. A couple of pictures had been found of Mr. Gordy. The hope was that um, 
uh, Heidi would be able to, uh, to identify uh, Mr. Gordy, Mr. Gordy's picture, uh, if they were presented to her with, with a number of other photographs. In, in this uh, pile of pictures, we're looking for somebody who looks like uh, Mr. Gordy. All right, so. What you are watching is real. Heidi Weirich is looking through the photographs for the first time. That is Mr. Gordy, you're right. Incredibly, Heidi had chosen the photograph of James Gordy. Twice now, the little girl had correctly identified her spirits from a photo lineup. Having spoken to, to Heidi and, and, and her parents, uh, I'm uh, even more convinced that, that we are dealing that we are dealing with uh, genuine uh, parapsychological experiences. Then the question comes up, why are these things happening to this little girl? Why indeed? Was it all just a coincidence? Did Heidi simply make two lucky guesses? Or does Heidi Weirich possess some mysterious power to communicate with the dead? I'm not scared of Khan and Mr. Gordy because they talk to me and they, they don't scare me, they play with me. And um, the reason I'm scared of the other ones is because they don't talk to me. And um, I can't see, um, I can't see his face. If she sees them, you know, they don't bother her and she talks to these people, then I'm fine with it, just so long as I don't see them. I think Heidi is special. I do, I, she's been seeing them for so long now. And uh, it's just something I don't think she'll ever grow out of. She's just a special child. She's gifted, so to speak. Is there truly an afterlife? A Sunday school teacher named Rossiter Raymond once wrote, death is only a horizon, and a horizon is nothing save the limit of our sight. Until we each embark on the final journey, what lies beyond will remain a source of wonder the most profound mystery of all.